And now it is my great pleasure, really, to introduce the moderator of our second panel, Jeanette Redensek. She's a historian of European modernism. She was a fellow in the Berlin program at the Freie Universität Berlin, where researching late Willemine sociology and urban reform. She holds a doctorate in the history of architecture and urbanism from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. Currently, she is a research curator at the Josef and Annie Albers Foundation, where she's preparing the Josef Albers Katalog Raisonné. A very warm welcome, Jeanette Redensek. Thank you. These, the Bauhaus objects have, a histories of, have histories of their own, but so do our institutions, and our institutions and these objects intersect and interact in complex ways affected by political histories, biographies, the art market, which I'm sure we'll hear more about. The Albers Foundation itself is a collecting institution organization which has a large archive and was bequeathed an interesting and large collection of works by Joseph Albers, who died in 1976, and Annie Albers, who died in 1994. It included a large number of Bauhaus objects and design-related materials of Joseph Albers, we Bauhaus weavings and preparatory materials, sketches, of Joseph Albers, and then a sizable collection of pedagogical materials, works by students and by his colleagues that Joseph Albers himself had taken with him when he emigrated to the, immigrated to the United States in order to guide his uh, work at Black Mountain College in North Carolina, where both Joseph and Annie lived and taught from 1934 to 1949. In 1949, Joseph and Annie Albers left Black Mountain College, but they didn't have jobs. So uh, it would be quite accurate to say that they couch surfed for a year or so. Um, a bit of teaching in, in Cincinnati, which uh, both Joseph and Annie liked as a city because of its German population and the warmth of the people. A bit of teaching at the Harvard University uh, design department where Walter Gropius still had quite a reputation. Eventually, Joseph got, a, got the call to teach at Yale University um, from 1950 to around 1962 when he retired and then began to paint like a maniac. Um, the foundation was started in 1971 and Following the reunification of Germany, which Annie Albers and her brother lived to see, they were able to sue for restitution of lost property and received a fraction of what their father's property was worth, a furniture showrooms and a workshop in central Berlin, which stands yet today in the Kronenstrasse Nummer 8 Zehn. Um, with that, with those funds, the Albers Foundation was able to acquire property and build a proper research institute in the countryside of Connecticut. Our objects do not generally have very complex provenances. They all come from the artists themselves. We have acquired works on the market subsequently, and when we do have the funds, we like to get Bauhaus work or other early paintings and sketches by the artist so that we can fill out that early history. Uh, the later history of Albers as a painter and Annie as a weaver um, is re comparatively more well known. So that's the background of the Albers Foundation. In our session today, Laura Muir from the Harvard University Art Museums um, Minka Thomas from Museum Boymans. <laughs> Moment. Um, Minka Thomas from Rotterdam is with us. Um, and then as, <laughs> you know, sometimes when you're standing in front of people, the words that you know, that you think you know so well fly out of your head. So please forgive me. Um, and has commentators, Susanna Grana from uh, Vitra Museum and Tilo. 
Kradag from Moment. Germanic National Museum. Yeah, yeah Germanic National Museum will comment. And uh, each of them will talk about their own institutions uh, collecting policies and intersection with Bauhaus history and with Bauhaus objects. So to begin, Laura Muir, who is research curator at the Harvard University Art Museums. She um, did her graduate studies in the history of photography and worked for quite a while in the Metropolitan Museum at a time when its collection was growing in a most interesting way and when the history of photography was truly spreading its wings and beginning to identify itself as an independent art form with its own technical and aesthetic histories. She joined the uh, Busch Reisinger Museum at Harvard, formerly known as the Germanic Museum, um, in 2001 and had worked there in collections and archive um, until becoming research curator in 2014. Uh, this past year, she organized from the Harvard University Art Museum's collections, the, the exhibition, The Bauhaus at Harvard. And so, Laura. Thank you, Jeanette, for the introduction, and to Florian and the whole Collecting Bauhaus team for this wonderful conference. And the invitation to participate. It is, I think, the perfect um, finale conclusion to the Bauhaus Centennial, and I'm really delighted to be here. Earlier this year, I curated the exhibition, The Bauhaus and Harvard at the Harvard Art Museums. And here you see an installation view, and I'm delighted that some of you had a chance to see it. Um, it comprised of nearly 200 objects by over 70 artists and was drawn almost entirely from the Busch Reisinger Museum's extensive Bauhaus collection. It was the first major exhibition of this material in nearly 50 years and presented an opportunity to reconsider the collection and its origins, as well as the unique history and relationship between the Bauhaus and Harvard. That relationship began in 1930, when the student-run Harvard Society for Contemporary Art organized the first Bauhaus exhibition in the United States, so eight years before MoMA's landmark exhibition in 1938. The university would later become a center for the Bauhaus in America when founding director Walter Gropius joined Harvard's architecture department in 1937. After the Second World War, with the aid of Gropius and many other former Bauhaus artists, Harvard's Germanic Museum, renamed the Busch Reisinger Museum in 1950, established a Bauhaus collection, which is today the largest of its kind outside of Germany. And here you see um, Bauhaus objects in the Busch Reisinger Museum library with Julia Feininger, who we have Lionel Feininger's archive at the Busch Reisinger Museum, together here with um, curator Charles Kuhn and a photograph by Lionel Feininger from around 1950. It was the first comprehensive Bauhaus study collection established a dozen years before the Bauhaus archive was founded in Darmstadt in 1960 and has played a decisive role in the legacy and reception of the Bauhaus in America. A recent exhibition explored the school's activities in Germany and its influence in the United States, but was shaped most strongly by the objects themselves. I was interested in what we could learn from their materiality, from their marks, stamps, and labels, as well as their condition. I was also interested in the networks to which each of these works belong and how they connect to other objects as well as people. And as part of this, I considered the, their mobility, their circulation, where they were exhibited and published, as well as the changes um, they underwent at different locations at different times. Um, including the works themselves. And for this talk, I have selected three exemplary objects to serve as case studies. Wilhelm Wagenfeld's coffee and tea service, Annie Albers' silk wall hanging, and Lucia Moholy's 
photograph of the Bauhaus master's housing. These objects and their individual histories can tell us much about their makers, the historical context in which they were produced, as well as the collecting and reception of modern German art in post-war America. Created within a few years of each other, they provide a window onto a specific moment in the history of Bauhaus, um, but their varied paths from Weimar and Dessau to Cambridge, Massachusetts, tell three very different stories, and they're abbreviated in um, the interest of time today. So Wilhelm Wagenfeld's coffee and tea service. When Wagenfeld arrived at the Bauhaus in 1923, he was already a trained silversmith. And while still completing the preliminary course under Maholi Nagy, he began working with the metal workshop. In April 1924, he completed his journeyman's exam as a silversmith. Like his iconic glass table lamp, the coffee and tea service employed a language of geometric abstraction. While the table lamp explored the circular form in three dimensions as disc, cylinder, and sphere, the coffee and tea service expanded this vocabulary to include circular and oval forms for the vessels, triangles for spouts, and tiny rectangles for the knobs on the lids. As Wagenfeld wrote in a 1924 issue of the Weimar Bauhaus publication, Yuga Menschen, the design was determined by the function of the object and the efficiency with which it could be manufactured. The cylindrical forms, according to Wagenfeld, were simple to assemble, while the, quote, eccentric arrangement of the lid and knob were a functional necessity, unquote, ensuring that the lid would stay closed while liquid was being poured. In 1925, Wagenfeld's design was featured in, let's see, in Bauhaus book number seven, New Works from the Bauhaus Workshops, in a photograph by Lucia Moholy. This set was made of nickel silver, noise silver, with ebony handles and knobs, like this example in the, the Weimar collection, and I apologize to Weimar colleagues for this terrible photograph which I made on a, a visit some years ago. The Harvard example, so this is made out of um, noid silver, and the Harvard example is brass with mercury silvered interiors. And when you have not come across another example like it, the first owner, Gropius's secretary, Hannah Lindman, believed it to be one of a kind, as she would later write to Bushreisinger Museum curator Charles Kuhn. When I left the Bauhaus, the masters wanted to give me a present, and I had the right to choose an object which I cherished. I was not shy in doing so, and I chose the best thing I knew at the time. This is a coffee and tea set, all made of brass, inside silver, hand hammered. It was produced in the 20s when Moholy was the master of the Metallwerkstatt. I don't think such an object exists anywhere else. Following her departure from the Weimar Bauhaus, Lindemann lived in Berlin and later moved to London. As the service was being packed for the move, Lindemann reported one of the handles of the sugar bowl broke off, and it's since been repaired, um, but it nevertheless remained one of her most treasured possessions. So moving on to object number two. Annie Fleischmann arrived at the Weimar Bauhaus as a prospective student in 1922. She joined the weaving workshop in 1923, and the, by the following year was making her first wall hangings. And here we have one of her record sheets um, documenting her, quote, first, wall, first pieces of weaving. In 1925, she married Josef Albers, who that year became a junior master at the Bauhaus. By the time Albers made her first silk wall hanging, or the silk wall hanging in Dessau in 1926, she was well established as a member of the weaving workshop and had been creating large scale weavings for almost two years. This delicate and lustrous one of a kind object was a major artistic and technical accomplishment of her Bauhaus period and among the works she listed on her Bauhaus diploma, which she was awarded on February 4th, 1930. Composed of equal sized stripes and solid rectangular units, Albers abstract geometric textile is a two-ply weaving executed on a 12 harness loom. 
Despite her limited palette of black, white, and yellow, Albers achieved a surprising number of color variations and combinations between the solid and striped units, which she meticulously plotted in a watercolor and gouache study that is also in the Harvard collection. For a while, Albers' wall hanging resided with her parents at their home in Berlin, where it was used as a cover for their piano. Although she would later refer to it as a Wandbehang, or wall hanging, and tapestry in English, on her Bauhaus diploma, it was listed as a Flügeldecke. And during this time, damp vases of flowers were displayed on top of the delicate textile, which resulted in ring-shaped stains and abrasions on the fabric. Years later, Albers would reflect on the schools and her own move away from, quote, romantic handicraft, unquote, and fragile textiles like this to developing durable, practical products that were e suited to industrial production. Quote, when you have a tablecloth that is so active, you can't put a plate on that tablecloth. You can't put a vase of flowers on it. It was far too dominating. After the closure of the Bauhaus in 1933, Annie and Josef Albers departed for the United States to teach at the Progressive Black Mountain College in North Carolina. A clipping from the New York Sun that Albers saved and later gave to the Germanic Museum herald heralded the arrival of, quote, one of Germany's foremost textile designers and continues, quote, Frau Albers looks more like a student than the leader of a movement. Today, she is known not only for the uniqueness of her designs, but for her experiments with materials, unquote. Early on, Albers seems to have appreciated the opportunities America would afford her to promote her accomplishments at the Bauhaus, as well as her continued work as an artist and teacher. Her eventual support of Harvard's Bauhaus initiative played an important role in this effort, as did her participation in the Museum of Modern Art's Bauhaus exhibition in 1938, which was the first major large-scale exhibition devoted to the school in the United States. Alberts contributed an essay on the weaving workshop to the show's Influentials catalog, and her 1926 wall hanging, now back in her possession, was prominently displayed along with other examples of Bauhaus weaving. And here you see an installation shot and um, the label from the loan label on the back of the textile. So moving on to our third object. Lucia Moholy arrived at the Weimar Bauhaus in 1923 when her husband, Hungarian constructivist artist Laszlo moholy Naj, had been was appointed to lead the metal workshop and preliminary course. Prior to their marriage in 1921, Moholy had worked as an editor at various publishing houses in Germany. In Weimar, she apprenticed with a professional photographer and continued her training in Leipzig with a course on photography and printing techniques. Her expertise in these areas proved indispensable to her work on numerous Bauhaus publications in the coming years. The project for which she is best known is the extensive documentation of Gropius's Bauhaus buildings in Dessau. Using glass plate negatives and a large format plywood camera mounted on a tripod, she produced hundreds of carefully composed images. The photograph in the Busch Reisinger Museum's collection that I'm talking today, about today is part of a series that Moholy made in 1920, between 1926 and 1928 of the faculty housing. In addition to documenting the construction of the homes and their exteriors, Moholy devoted considerable energy to photographing the interiors, focusing most extensively on the director's single family house, which you see at the bottom left, and the half of the two family house that she shared with her husband, Moholy Naj. Like the Gropius home, the Moholy Naj house was furnished with products from, of the Bauhaus workshops, and her photograph masterfully brings together art, design, and architecture in a harmonious, coordinated whole. It is the result of multiple choices and interventions. Her very deliberate arrangement of the objects in, results in a life-size volume and space construction. The subtle angling of the Breuer club chair, the strong vertical created by the placement of the flower vase on top of the bookshelf, and the dark rectangle of the stool mirror aspects of the painting by Moholy Naj that hangs on the wall. 
the oblique angle of the photograph makes the room feel more spacious and welcoming. And finally, Moholy's skillful use of light and shadow allows her to incorporate the large window, otherwise impossible to show from this angle, and the generous amount of light it admits, while infusing the space with an almost theatrical quality. And not surprisingly, this became one of the best known photographs devoted to the Bauhaus vision of modern living. Following their departure from the Bauhaus in 1928, Lucia and Laszlo Moholy-Nagy moved to Berlin where they separated the next year. Moholy brought with her the negatives of her Bauhaus photographs, which she continued to print. She also continued to work on various projects with Gropius, who had also left the Bauhaus in 1928 to return to private architectural practice. Although no longer the director of the Bauhaus, Gropius was still actively promoting its achievements through projects such as, as his 1930 publication, Bauhaus Buildings Dessau, which was published as the 12th um, Bauhaus book in 1930, which surveyed Gropius' architectural projects in Dessau. Moholy helped edit the volume in which over 50 of her photographs are reproduced, along with photographs by other artists you see, Feininger on the left and Kanz Müller on the right. The print in the Busch Reisinger Museum's collection of Moholy's living room is one of several in, at Harvard that appear to have been printed in connection with this publication. The various marks inscriptions, stamps, and labels that appear on the verser of the photograph tell us much about the life of the object and the work that it did. Moholy's artist stamp in purple ink is very faintly visible at the upper right corner, photo Lucia Moholy, and her inventory number is inscribed nearby in graphite. Reproduction-related notations also appear, including retouching instructions. It is not clear who wrote, retouch out the lights, or who did the actual retouching in order to remove the lighting fixtures that crisscross the ceiling. You have a kind of before and after retouching. But given Moholy's background in publishing and close involvement in edi the editing of this publication, it seems plausible that they were her instructions intended to make the image align even closer to Gropius's idealized vision of the modern domestic interior. Moholy's view of the opposite direction was subjected to even more aggressive retouching. Let me see. <laughs> also the before and after. The instructions specify that the lights be removed and that only two pillows remain on the sofa. The retouching of these two photographs correspond exactly to the way they are reproduced in the Bauhaus building's Dessau publication. Gropius's accompanying text, echoing contemporaries such as Bruno Taut in his influential 1924 book, The New Dwelling, Woman as Creator, suggests that the problems of the overwhelmed housewife will be solved by rejecting ornate furnishings and superfluous objects, pillows, for example, acquired in pursuit of an outdated notion of coziness or gemütlichkeit, and by embracing a clean, efficient, and rational domestic environment of the new dwelling, exemplified here, of course, by the Bauhaus master's house. The photographs of Moholy's living room, along with others used for the Bauhaus building's Dessau publication, remained with Gropius after the book's publication in 1930 as part of a growing archive of photographs relating to his various architectural projects. These were transported from Berlin to London, where the Gropiuses moved in 1934, and continued their journey to the United States in 1937, following Gropius' appointment as professor of architecture at Harvard University. Moholy also tried to make the journey to America. In 1940, Moholy-Nagy invited her to teach photography at the Institute of Design in Chicago, but she was denied a visa by the United States and remained in England where she had lived since 1933. Once these photographs left her possession, Moholy was no longer involved in the reproduction and publication and knew little of how these were being used. Although for years to come, they would be, continue to be employed by Gropius in his ongoing efforts to publicize the work of the Bauhaus. In the early 1930s, Harvard University began to play an important role in the promotion and reception of modern German art in the United States through its Germanic Museum. Since its founding in 1901, the museum had exclusively collected plaster casts. 
and other types of reproductions in order to illustrate the development of Germanic art. In 1930, a major shift occurred when Charles Kuhn, the museum's enterprising new curator, instituted policies that embraced the acquisition and display of contemporary art. During his first year as curator, Kuhn reconfigured the museum's galleries in order to present a display of contemporary sculpture and decorative arts. The museum's first Bauhaus acquisition, a, a coffee pot, cup, and saucer by Otto Lindig, which you see on the right, was displayed in the central case. And soon after, Kuhn acquired works by Bauhaus faculty Lionel Feininger, Paul Clay, and Vasily Kandinsky. Following the second, his return from service in the Second World War, Kuhn began to contemplate new initiatives, which would build on the foundations of the modern art collection he had began before the, the war, as well as Gropius's presence at Harvard. One of the most important of these projects planned for the future, Kuhn reported in 1948, is the assembly of a study of study material related to the Bauhaus. Gropius was enthusiastic and offered crucial support, providing Kuhn with the addresses of many former Bauhaus artists living in the United States and abroad. As well as, as a result of Kuhn's appeal, appeals, the museum soon began to receive donations, and by the end of 1948 had amassed nearly 400 objects. For Gropius and the many artists who contributed to, to this effort, the Bauhaus collection at Harvard represented an opportunity to preserve this material but also secure the legacy of the school as well as their own contributions as artists. For the Germanic Museum, this initiative was a means of reinvigorating itself at a time when its own status was precarious. By promoting the Bauhaus as a pioneering educational institution that embraced experimentation and artistic freedom, which was destroyed by the National Socialists, Kuhn's project seemed necessary and urgent to an American public still harboring anti-German feelings, but also fitting for an educational institution like Harvard that stood to embody these values. Hannah Lindemann was the, the owner of the Bagenfeld Coffee and Tea Service was not a direct recipient of Kuhn's appeal. She learned about it while facilitating a donation from former Bauhaus professor Ludwig Hilbersheimer, who had immigrated to Chicago in 1938. His name had appeared on Gropius's list, list, and you see it highlighted here. And in 1950, he had donated a dozen documentary photographs of the, his architectural and urban planning work. The material now in question was a collection of over 1,500 textile samples by his fiancée, Otti Berger, which the former Bauhaus weaver had left in storage in London. <coughs> Berger had hoped to join Hilversheimer in Chicago, but in 1944 was arrested in her hometown in Yugoslavia and deported to Auschwitz concentration camp where she was murdered. Hilbersheimer donated the collection to the Bushreisinger Museum, but needed Lindemann's assistance to organize the shipment from <coughs> England. Isogropius also became involved, advocating for the acquisition and helping to facilitate the transport. Writing to Charles Kuhn in October 1951, Isogropius noted, noted that Lindemann was, quote, a former and very trusted secretary of my husband's who worked for him during the Bauhaus period. She resides now in London, and when she, we left there, we asked her to take over this matter of investigating Otti Berger's patterns and samples which were stored in London. My husband is particularly keen to see her theoretical and teaching methods go to the museum. Hardly anybody in, in the Bauhaus understood so completely and carried out so successfully the working methods that my husband tried to develop during the nine years when he ran the Bauhaus." Unquote. Many more letters passed back and forth between Kuhn, Hilbersheimer, Isogropius, and Lindemann until the extensive collection finally arrived safely at Harvard and was received as a gift of Hilbersheimer in 1952 and is the largest surviving collection of Berger's work. As a result of this, Lindemann was herself inspired to donate the Wagenfeld Coffee and Tea Service to Harvard's growing Bauhaus collection. In 1951, she wrote to Kuhn, 
I am interested to help you in your building up of your Bauhaus department. As I have no children who could cherish the set as an heirloom, I shall gladly give it to you as a donation. Kuhn did not initially solicit donations from Ani Albers either, but he did write to her husband, who responded in August 1948 with enthusiasm, adding in a postscript, quote, my wife is going to write to you in a day or two with some other suggestions, unquote. And by late September, Ani Albers was corresponding directly with Kuhn about the acquisition of her work. I selected a number of textile samples, designs, and photographs from the Bauhaus time, and I'm sending them to you today. As to the large tapestry of mine, the silk wall hanging, it is from the year 1926. The price corresponds somewhat to that of a picture, for tapestries are, to my mind, a kind of picture." Unquote. By the end of the year, Albers and Kuhn had negotiated a price for her silk wall hanging. It was half of what she had originally asked, but she accepted Kuhn's offer because she felt that the museum's Bauhaus archive was, quote, the place I really think it should be, unquote, but with the explicit um, request that the wall hanging be included in the retrospective exhibition of her work that Philip Johnson was organ organizing at the Museum of Modern Art. This was the first solo exhibition MoMA devoted to a weaver or a female Bauhaus artist, and after being presented in New York, it traveled to 26 museums in the United States and Canada, including the Bushreisinger Museum in 1950. The following year, Albers Wall Hanging was presented at the Bushreisinger in its first major exhibition of its Bauhaus collection, alongside other objects acquired through Kuhn's um, initiative, and also some loans. The model of the Bauhaus is actually on loan from the Museum of Modern Art. And thereafter, the wall hanging was on view frequently at Harvard and on loan to many important outside exhibitions from Hartford to Honolulu. Shortly before his death in 1969, Walter Gropius donated his architectural archive to the Bushreisinger Museum. But it would be more than a decade before Issa Gropius would donate the related photographs, photographic archive her husband had amassed in connection with this work. Along with the proofs, for a set of proofs for the Bauhaus building's Dessau, which you see on the top right. Um, although Moholy's photographs are now considered to be a cornerstone of Harvard's Bauhaus holdings, until a recent initiative, many of her prints were still cataloged under the name of Gropius. Long overdue, Moholy's authorship and artistry, as well as the central role her photographs played in constructing the Bauhaus image, is finally being recognized as a major artistic achievement. The stories of these three objects illustrated, illustrate the diversity of ways in which Harvard's Bauhaus collection was built. They also help us to better understand what was at stake for the Busch-Reisinger Museum, Gropius, and the other donors in establishing and contributing to this collection. We foregrounded these histories in our recent exhibition, but also prioritized the individual object in our symposium this past March, Bauhaus 100 Object Lessons from a Historic Collection, which featured new research on key objects. And an edited, ver edited versions of these papers will be published in our forthcoming publication, Object Lessons, the Bauhaus and Harvard, which will, will appear next fall. We hope that these efforts and the renewed interest and momentum generated by the centennial will inspire future scholarship. And I invite all of you to visit our Bauhaus collection website where you can access information on the 32,000 Bauhaus related objects at Harvard. There's still much to be discovered and many new stories to tell. Thank you.